to be a couple more minutes before we start, folks. Already racing up to our first 100 participants, which is great. While we're awaiting folks, you might notice the shiner that is on the eye of Andrew, our CIO there. I can assure you that's not because the financial markets have been beating him up. How did you get that, mate? Was it in a... No, I was, uh, I was going to introduce that myself, but thank you, Sam. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's uh, a relic of a football match on Friday evening, so I, uh, I'm still daft enough to do that sort of thing. Did you win? Oh, no. Oh, dear. Okay. All right. <laughs> the folks will just start in two more minutes now, not too much longer now. Then we'll get going. I think we'll sort of start pretty much on the dot at uh, 12 o'clock because I'm conscious that this will be people's lunch hour right now. So we don't want to take up too much of it or we'll have it running over your lunch hour. So just a few more seconds and we'll get going. Alrighty, it's 12 o'clock. Well, why don't we start on the dot and then I'm sure some other people will join. Hi, I'm um, Sam and this is Andrew. Um, we're two of the four um, founders of Simplicity and thanks very much for joining our call. We thought we'd do this call, we normally do them fairly regularly, but we thought we'd do this one at fairly short notice because there's a lot going on in financial markets at the moment. There's a lot of talk about inflation, interest rates and so on. And we thought, look, it would be timely right now to talk about those topics. So how we will run this is, um, unusual. I don't usually have a lot of slides, but unusually I've got a few slides, but they're all pictures. And I'm gonna get through the presentation in uh, no more than 20, 25 minutes, which will leave lots of time for Q&A. We, ha we, um, we have this sort of last person standing uh, thing on Q&A, you just carry on asking the questions and we'll carry on answering them. So please feel under no obligation to stay on the call at all, just leave when you feel like it. And if I can just, um, ask the one question I will ask of you the fa a favor is that if you like what you hear, obviously Simplicity is a non-profit business. We don't like spending your money on marketing. So please, if you like what you hear, please just tell your friends about us. That would be great. So um, welcome to Andrew. Andrew is the person who's responsible for investing all the money for Simplicity. And, um, and Andrew will be, you know, chipping in uh, and we'll be asking questions and certainly helping out with the answers as well. So why don't I go to uh, screen share now and I'll talk to you about what we're, what we're going to be talking about today. Um, let me just get this uh, up running now. So can I just uh, make sure that we, we can see that, Andrew? Is that up on your screen? Yep. Yeah, that's okay, so welcome, welcome. This is the, the three things we wanted to talk about on this presentation, although you can ask any question at the end about any subject. Let's just talk about inflation because a lot of people are talking about it. They're talking about it, in fact, it affecting our cost of living, the price of everything. And so we'll talk about inflation. Why is it here? What is likely to happen with it? And I guess the flows on the next question is what can I do? both in terms of living, but most importantly, from our point of view, in terms of investing in your investments and KiwiSaver and funds and so on. And then I guess it's, it's worth talking about house prices too, because it's A, it's such a topic for New Zealanders, uh, but also obviously we've had huge increases in uh, uh, house prices. So just our view on where to from here. So first of all, I just wanted to remind you folks about, you know, when you listen to any presentation, kind of really useful to know what is the perspective of the person who's speaking to you. And so in this case, uh, this our perspective is why we exist as a nonprofit owned by charity is to give people dignity, dignity in retirement, dignity of their first home. How we do that is by giving people choices and people have choices when they have more money. So what we do is make you more money. That's why we're nonprofit, charge very low fees, all that sort of thing. More money gives more choices, more choices gives you dignity. So it's not about making money for ourselves. It's an important perspective. The other thing is, it's a very, very long-term perspective. Simplicity is designed to last 100 years. We're structured like Southern Cross. 
We're a non-profit that gives 15% of its fees to charity. And those are all the products we're now involved in. All of those products, KiwiSaver, investment funds, mortgages, and now into affordable housing and rentals is all about making uh, your life more affordable. And they're very, very long-term and very large scale projects over time. So the perspective you will get from us is never gonna be one month, three months, not even one year. It's gonna be three, five, 10, 15, 20 years because that's how long most of our members will be investing for. Very happy to give you a short-term view. We generally have no idea uh, what markets will be doing in the short term and not much more of an idea long-term, but we do look back in history and draw some conclusions which are very powerful. So let's look back in history. This is a, a chart I throw up on almost every presentation. And it's to show you 100 years of the US stock market. We don't have that sort of data in New Zealand, so we go back there. Just a couple of things to be reminded when you get these times of high interest rates, people are getting nervous, house prices are crazy and so on. Look at the share market. It's a really good benchmark for what happens actually in the world of, of finance and money. And have a look at this. First of all, is it's a random walk, right? It's almost impossible to predict what will happen next. And also, you know, the markets go up and down, but over time, they go up over time. And that's really because financial markets are a distilled um, uh, example of human endeavor. As long as people get up and want to make their lives better and run companies and set up companies and make profit and employ people, the world gets richer, the world gets better. So the other thing, too, is those gray bars, though, are the recessions and depressions. And you can see that they're pretty round. They happen regularly but they're very, very unpredictable. And we've just seen one with COVID. Who would have predicted it three years ago? But in context of what we're seeing in terms of markets, we've seen a long rise up in markets for a long period of time now. And we've seen a massive period of nervousness during COVID, but have a look at it in context. In the context of 100 years history, even COVID, not that big a deal for financial markets. So what you're hearing now too, may well end up being not that big a deal as well, but we'll, we'll go into that a little bit more. And remember also long term, this goes back to 2001, but we could go right back in history, interest rates have generally been trending down and we've seen a big blip up and they may go even further. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But the context of the interest rate environment is generally technology being very deflationary, people doing things more efficiently, and therefore prices trending down over time. Now, obviously, there's some huge exceptions, and we'll talk about that right now because inflation is very much a topic on people's minds. But just be mindful of the trend. A lot of deflationary forces over, over history, driven primarily by technology. Now, those interest rates we talked about are driven by inflation. So let's just look at inflation. Let's, this is New, Ze uh, New Zealand inflation back to the year 2000. And you'll see it's really blipped up, right? It's not out of context, particularly in history. Back in 2011, which is only 10 years ago, it was this high, and it was that high again in 2008. So while it seems a bit scary now, and everywhere you get huge newspaper headlines, remember, you know, financial analysts and newspapers and so on make money by generating dramatic headlines. But let's look at this in the context of history. We have a, uh, an inflation rate of around about 5%, but that is not unusual in history. And if we go back in history, let's go right back to 1960, you will see that inflation used to be all over the place. You know, you talk about high mortgages now. My parents bought their first house and paid 26% interest on their first mortgage. That's what inflation, inflation can do when it's really, really terrible. But you'll see there's been a period of control of inflation over a long period of time. Andrew, you might just like to comment just very quickly on why you think inflation has been so subdued for the last, gosh, what's that, almost 30 years now? Oh, I think you touched on it mostly, Sam. It's just general improvements in both productivity and particularly through technology. Um, and, and what that's led to and what's really changed things is people's inflationary expectations. People don't and won't pay more for something they'll wait for the price to come down. Whereas go back 30 years, people would buy it today because they were, they were worried it was going to be up in price the next day. So just a, a general change in attitudes and expectations over, over a long period of time. Right, thanks. So you had a short, yeah, a short uptick in inflation and that generates a lot of high, uh, headlines, but in hindsight, not such a big deal. But why are we getting this inflation? Why is it going up? Well, the first thing is spending, right? What has happened post-COVID is governments have got out checkbooks and have written enormous checks 
This is the amount of direct government spending globally that has been spent on COVID re uh, response. So this is just direct government spending, $9 trillion. And you'll see various countries there. New Zealand is not on this survey, but we're, 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 you know, we're, we're way up there as well. You'll see a lot of the countries like Japan, for example, have spent 50% of its GDP on, on direct government spending. That is an astronomical sum of money. And in fact, the IMF predicted that if you added up all of the COVID support from, so this is the OECD, from all of the OECD countries, it's over 20% of GDP. Now, to put that into perspective, that is three times the money that they spent after the global financial crisis. So you have never had so much money pumped into the economy in history, actually, well, in recorded history, uh, with the data we have, as you've had during COVID. Now, what happens is when you have a huge pile of money chasing the same pile of goods and services, it's not like the number of cars has gone up three times or the number of smartphones has gone up three times in three years. So you've got more money chasing the same pile of goods uh, and services. That is inflationary. That You get a big inflationary pressure. That is what we call you know, demand-driven inflation. And here's the other thing too. This is cost. This is a chart showing the cost of shipping a container from Asia to Northern Europe. You'll see those blue lines on the right is the percentage increase year on year. So in 2021, the percentage increase of sh shipping a container was 600%. The price went up six times. And that is because you had, well, you know, you had ships clogging up the Suez Canal. You had, um, a, you know, a shortage of containers in the right place. You had people being sick with COVID, which means they couldn't turn up at the ports to process the containers. And that all led to huge cost price inflation. But that's a familiar story all over the world, right? You've had semiconductor shortages. You've had labor shortages because people haven't been able to move around the world because the borders have been shut down. You've seen that in New Zealand. You can't find people to pick apples, for example. So the price of apple picking goes up. All that. It's all very normal stuff. And you've seen a lot of cost cost uh, inflation. Now, I just want to talk about there's a lot of dramatic headlines in this, but let's just put this in perspective a little bit here. If you have a look at that sh cost of shipping that container, you'll see some charts showing it's horrible, but actually it's starting to come down. From about September, October, shipping costs, while still high, are actually trending down. As Andrew said, you know, people get used to it. People start moving around a bit more, borders start opening up, labor becomes more mobile, factories start working again, the general supply chain, uh, which was working incredibly efficiently before COVID and is likely to work just as efficiently again, by the way, is starting to free up. And here's the other thing. People talk about, you know, record shipping rates and all that sort of thing. Well, actually, that's rubbish. That's rubbish. If you have a look, this is called the Baltic Dry Index. This is what it costs to transport dry goods like minerals or corn or anything in a big bulk carrier. Well, it went up in 2021 to huge rates, up to 4,000. But look back in history, just before the global financial crisis, in fact, uh, just on the global financial crisis, it actually went up to, it was three times as high. And you see straight afterwards in 2009, it went down to one-tenth of the price it was from its peak. So these things can be very, very volatile. And I'll talk about that because it relates to our housing market as well why our housing prices have gone up so much in the short time and what they're likely to do from now. So these things can be very, very volatile. They depend a lot on demand, but also on supply. It doesn't matter how much demand there is, if there's not enough ships to move the goods, the price is gonna go up. If there are too many ships, the price is gonna go down. And most, the prices of most things are set in the long term by how much supply there is, not by how much demand there is. And we'll get onto that with regards to housing. And here's the other thing is, you know, Unemployment has gone down. Why has unemployment gone down? Well, first of all, remember that money that, that the governments have pumped into the economy? That generates employment. When the government spends money, people get jobs or people at least keep their jobs. And also with the borders being closed down, people haven't been able to move around. And that means countries have had to source labor from within their own country. And that matters a lot. Even in New Zealand, we have a lot of imported labor to do things that the locals are less keen on doing, so less keen on doing, like fruit picking, for example. And so you, you will see uh, unemployment rates have gone down. This is the United States number, but it's very similar in, in New Zealand and in the OECD. And that means the price of labor goes up, and that's also inflationary, all perfectly understandable. So where is the market direction from here? I know you're expecting me to push a button and then a graph shows up it's gonna stay blank because we have absolutely no idea.
where the market goes from here. Andrew, do you know where the market's going from here? You know I don't. Yeah, nobody does. And actually, folks, nobody does. At best, it's an educated guess. And I'll talk about why it is crazy to predict the direction of financial markets uh, uh, in a minute, but we really have no idea. So that sort of leads to the question, well, okay, you know, back to this chart again, it could go down. If you've seen the center period in that chart there, it went down for about three, three decades. Markets can go down for a very long period of time. In that time, they can have short, sharp jumps up. And likewise, periods can, markets can go up for a long time too with short, sharp drops down. But overall, if you are a long-term investor, if you think financial markets are going to go down and you're betting against them, unless you are taking a very educated and a very short-term view, so unless you know a whole lot more than people like ourselves do and you take a very short view, you are betting against history by getting out of the financial markets when they go down a bit. And remember the psychology of investing. It's called loss aversion. It means that you hate losing a dollar more than you love making a dollar. So fear makes you do things which you usually subsequently regret or can certainly regret. An example we're starting to see is in this, Andrew, we're seeing people switching out of growth funds to conservative funds now because they're scared, because they think, oh, the market's gone for a run. It can't go any further. I'm going to get out. I'll talk about market timing in a minute because it is extremely difficult to do and get right. It certainly makes you feel good. You think, oof. I protected my assets, I'm in a more conservative fund, and then you miss the next gap up. So if you have a long-term plan, stick to the plan. Warren Buffett, the, arguably the world's most successful investor of all time, said, I'm almost criminally negligent with markets. I will pay almost no attention to what they do because short-term markets are a voting machine, financial markets, long-term, they're a weighing machine. Long-term, they sensibly reflect the human endeavor and the profits companies make. And so on. over the long term, they go up because our lives get better. But in the short term, that's them being a weighing machine. But in the short term, they're a voting machine. They trade on emotions and fear and all those sorts of things. And he says, don't trade on that. And we completely agree. So what can you personally do in these circumstances? You've got inflation going up. You've got costs going up. You've got interest rates going up. You've got share markets going down. You can get very nervous about this, right? But the same old rules apply. And I don't know, Andrew, you and I are pretty wizened old buggers now. How many financial market downturns have you been through? I think this is my seventh. Yeah, I think we, we went through this before. With them, but the, my first big one was 87. So um, Yeah, exactly. So, so, so we hopefully we have a little bit of the wisdom of experience here. But so what do you do? The same old rules apply. Look, as a general rule, if you look out long term, this is what you can sort of say. If inflation goes up, the price of shares and the price of houses will go up over time. The, 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 the value of bonds will ultimately be okay because they're paying interest all the time, right? So even though they may lose some capital value, they're paying interest and so they can be flat over time or in the short term, they can go down. And then if inflation goes down on the right-hand side, if, if inflation is going down, Generally, that is also good for shares and homes. Not quite so good, but generally pretty good. And it's good for the bond market. If, if Think about it as a pendulum. If interest rates go down here, the value of bonds goes up. And likewise, if interest rates go up, the value of bonds goes down. So that's the long-term trend. What does that mean? I mean, let me just go back to that. Even if you knew this, it's very hard to pick which shares win, which countries will do better than others, so on and so forth. And you don't know whether inflation will go up or down. We just don't know what the future direction will be. So the same old rule about diversification absolutely applies here. So this is a chart. I'll just show you an example. Look in the right-hand column there. In 2020, at the top is the asset class that best performed, and at the bottom is the asset class that worst performed. And just have a look at those colors. It's a real mixture. It's a completely random walk. Nobody knows which will be top and which will be bottom next year. Now, there are a lot of people who will charge you extra fees to say that they think they know, but we'll go through statistically what are the chances of them winning in a minute. But certainly what this does is this is the chart that lets you sleep at night. I'm ultimately the person responsible for four and a half billion dollars worth of members' money. I sleep very well at night knowing that every one of our diversified funds, investment funds in KiwiSafe has 3,000 investments 
over 3,000 investments in 23 countries. So it doesn't matter what happens, some uh, companies will win and some companies will lose because even in the worst circumstances, there are winners and losers. It is very, very rare that everything goes down or everything goes up. Diversification is your friend. It is an absolute free gift in investing. There, you get very little for free in the financial markets, but you get diversification for free. So stay diversified. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Here's the other thing, folks. You know, I know you hear it from us a long time. Fees, fees, fees. Boy, if you think that you should be paying less in good times, you should be paying less in, in, in the bad times as well, right, for the same stuff. This is a, a an often quoted number by us. I don't think that the rest of the industry wants you to know this, but the average New Zealander will spend about $46,900 in fees over their lifetime using current fee levels for KiwiSaver compared to just over $20,000 for mobile phones and $25,000 for power. If you had thought, if you told somebody, did you know you'll spend more on KiwiSaver fees than you will on power your lifetime? People go, wow, you know, and then they start paying attention. If you save some fees, you know, that lifetime 46 1900 we we know at a current fee level you'd be saving about um thirty two thousand dollars in fees with us and that compounds up to sixty thousand almost sixty thousand dollars worth of value when you retire using current fee levels now you can try and beat the market if you want to uh, or you can just pay less fees and achieve the same thing in an incredibly easy and predictable way the other thing is in this market is don't be afraid of the share market. It swings up and down, it gets lots of noise. But here's an example, I've used this one chart before, $1 invested in the Australian share market, because we have 100 year data on this, um, would now be worth $280,000. So $1 to $280,000. Now that is before taxation, it doesn't take account of inflation and so on. So, But it, it shows you that over history, you get about almost 12% return from shares. But you can see some little dips in there. Those were actually massive dips. Like go through and down to 2008 and the right-hand side, that last big dip, it doesn't look very much, but that was the global financial crisis. And boy, you could have sold out of everything and panicked. At that time, if ever there was a time to panic in financial markets, it was that. But that shows you in history, that wasn't a particularly big dip. Go back right down to 1930 there. That was the global depression, that dip there at 1930. And as you see, if you waited... The trend was your friend, history was on your side and you made money. But if you put your money into the bond market, Australian government bonds, you see you would have made 6% over history. And if you'd stuck it in term deposits, you would have made about 4.8%. The power of that compounding, you know, the money that makes, the, the, the money makes money uh, uh, and, and it compounds up and that shows you. So don't be afraid of the share market, even when times uh, are tough. Now, here's the other thing is, don't trade the markets. Here's a, use this chart beforehand. If you think that you can get out and get in to the financial markets, boy, I mean, well, I'm not sure that we would hire you, Andrew, because we don't believe anybody can. But if you really, really can, then fantastic. But have a look at what happens if you'd put 10,000 in the US share market in 1999, just stuck in the bottom of the drawer and forgot about it, never ever paid attention to it again, that would be worth about $30,000 now. So 22 years later, 23 years later, it would be worth three times as much. But if you had missed out on the 10 best days of trading, if you had just thought, oh, the market's too high, or I'm getting out, and you just missed 10 days of trading in 30 years, you would have only made 2%. It's amazing, huh? So 3.6% compounding return was lost by not being in the market for 10 days in 30 years. Then you go right down to if you'd missed the 60 best days at the bottom there, you know what? You would have lost money. Your $10,000 would only be worth $2,600 because all of that money was made, well, some, a huge amount of money was made in just 60 days. So that tells you that unless you are a perfect market timer, and I've yet to meet one and probably never will, you need to stay in the markets. And let me show you some examples. So Standard & Poor's do this survey. You will never hear about this from active fund managers. It's called the Spiva studies. But this shows you how many fund managers underperform the index, underperform doing what we do, which is just effectively doing nothing but buying the whole market or buying a huge chunk of the market and just holding it forever. It's called passive investing. Over the last 10 years, down the bottom there, you'll see that 82% of fund managers of funds run in the United States underperformed the S&P 500. So by just buying the market and doing nothing, you would have outperformed 
82% of managers in the United States. These are, by the way, professional fund managers who say they can time the markets. And that's because of the effect of fees. It doesn't matter what they make above the market, their fees more than eat away the added value that they gain. Now, would you go to a casino and take a bet where you have an 82% chance of losing? Would you invest in anything else where you have an 82% large of losing? The answer is, well, we do, I do. It's called a lotto ticket, right? It's called a lot, you, you, you do do these things. But with your investments and your retirement savings and your hard earned money, we don't think you should be taking that sort of bet. And by the way, it's not just the United States market. Over 15 years, I've got even more data in, in Australia, 85% of funds underperformed their local index. In Europe, 85% over the last five years. So the chances of you winning are very low indeed. And let, let, let's take it one step further. Let's say, because you know how these active managers say, look, I, I, these passive guys, they just sit there and they make money in the good times. But when there's a lot of volatility, when there's a lot of news, when you can trade markets, that's when we really add value. Really? Okay, let's look at the data. The same data over the last three years. That's one year before COVID and two years, almost getting into over two years now, of COVID-related market volatility. All the chance in the world to add value and make money. 67% of managers still underperformed, right? Two-thirds underperformed. So I don't know. Do you want to put your money in a market where you have a two-thirds chance of doing worse than doing nothing? In Australia, 75% of people underperformed over the last three years. In Europe, 72% underperformed. So if you can pick those winning managers, by all means, go for it. But the reason we set up uh, Simplicity as a passive low fee manager is because of this survey. It's because it shows you statistically the chances of you beating the market are very slim indeed. So, and, uh, and you know, I mentioned this before, it's because of the fees. The fees they charge do not make up. There's any value they add by picking stocks and picking markets gets eroded by high fees. So that's one story. But the other story about this inflation and prices rising and so on is don't forget the impact of KiwiSaver on New Zealand. It is a rising tide of capital. It is now, Andrew, is KiwiSaver sort of 85, 87 billion now? It's a lot of money, huh? Yeah, you're usually better at those stats than I am. But I yeah, think it I think it's, it's, yeah. it's over 85 billion now, but it's growing all the time. Every single day, Simplicity receives net inflows of money to invest in the financial markets. So that tells you that the stock market and the bond market have a very, are very well supported by new money coming in and buying it every day. So you are betting against a very long-term trend if you bet against financial markets generally, and by the way, in most developed countries, this is the same. Populations are still aging. People are saving for their retirement. The stock markets are very well supported. So you may bet against a rising tide. You may bet that what you, you know one that, that you can time when the particular wave that might not knock down your sandcastle. But remember, the tide is rising. It's very unlikely that you'll win in the long term. By the way, that's a very positive news for New Zealand. It's great for money being invested funding businesses, new businesses, technology businesses, creating high value jobs and so on. If you have um, children or grandchildren now, they've totally lucked out. I think they're, they've been born in one of the best times in New Zealand's history. If you see through COVID and the fear and the nervousness, the environmental issues, I, I get all of that. But fundamentally, New Zealand is gonna go from being a capital poor to a capital richer country. And the problems of having more money are way better than the problems of having less money. So big question now, I just want to get onto it and we'll have questions in about five minutes. Will house prices rise or fall? The big question. Here's an interesting chart. This shows how house prices have changed since the year 2000. And as you can see, just recently, a massive spike up in prices. They rose about, this is national house price, about 26%. I don't know if you know this, but we now have almost one, almost $1.7 trillion in houses in New Zealand. Our economy, our GDP is about 200 billion, a little bit more than that. The value of houses is, is uh, what's that, Andrew? That's almost seven, seven, eight times that. Over eight times our GDP is the value of our houses. You mentioned a survey, Andrew, you told me about it this morning with, is it New Zealand's housing market? Yeah, I it's, it's a good article on Bloomberg just looking at international house prices and New Zealand 
on, a, on the basis of income to price and on the basis of rent to price, New Zealand's the most expensive housing market in the world. So that's, so that's scary, folks, right? So you would ask yourself, do I sell my house? Or if I want to buy a house, do I still buy a house? And so on. Well, let's look once again at the perspective of history, because this chart I showed you is just back to 2000. Let's go right back to 1960, right? And look at house prices in New Zealand. So let's go back 70, uh, sorry, 62 years. No, sorry, 52 years. Um, and you'll see there that how, how the, the recent ri price rise is extreme and dramatic. But the trend has been for house prices to rise in New Zealand very consistently for a very long period of time. Only in one period in 2008 did house prices fall. Now, why is that? There's some very powerful demographic uh, features there, right? New Zealand's population was rising. There were more people buying the same amount of land. The second thing is the New Zealanders that came here were getting richer. Our GDP was growing and therefore our incomes were growing and therefore we spent more on houses. That is still intact. In fact, New Zealand has had a lockstep up in its productivity and GDP per capita versus the rest of the world. We are more competitive than we used to be. I don't know if you know this now, but our GDP per capita is actually tracking, I think it's in about the top 10 of OECD countries now in terms of growth rates. It was consistently in the bottom 10 in history. So we are getting better at getting wealthier. So that money chases property. The third thing is we've had a huge tax incentive to buy and own properties. That is still largely intact, not for investment properties, but you still only have this bright line test, right? You can still get tax-free capital gains. You just have to own the house for a long time. And if it's your primary point of residence, which is what we, you know, your first home, which is what most of us spend most of our money on, then that's still a tax-free capital gain. So the tax incentive is still sort of very much in place for long-term investors and owners. So if you are choosing to sell or saying, listen, I'm not going to buy now because I think prices will go down, that may well happen, but I just wanted to put this into perspective. Over the very long term, the trend has been for house prices to continue to go up. And in inflationary times, inflation raises the price of houses. It very rarely uh, uh, reduces the price of houses. I remember this time last year writing an article and stuff when all of the economists were saying, oh, house prices are going to go down because of COVID. And I was saying, you kind of got to be kidding yourself. The government cannot print this much money and put it in the pockets of New Zealanders. And New Zealanders, when they have extra money, put it into the mortgage or buy another investment property. So house prices are likely to go up. So will they go up or down? Well, uh, oh, sorry, just one other thing before we make that prediction. Here's a really interesting chart from Spinoff. This shows, I think, Andrew, this is your point, right? That prices in New Zealand of houses have well outstripped wage increases and well outstripped the growth in rents. Both have grown, but house prices have gone up so much. So where will house prices go from here? Well, let's have a look at what I think is the really critical issue, and that is supply. Remember how I mentioned that it doesn't matter what happens with demand, long-term pr prices get swung around by how much supply there is. And just look at the bottom. I mean, you may be from different regions in the country, I'm sure you are, but look at the bottom one. Just, just, just to give you an example here. Here's housing demand for 2019, 20, and 21. And as you can see that in New Zealand, typically the demand for new houses is somewhere between 30 and 45,000 houses. Now, last year it took a massive dip. Why was that? Borders were closed, no net immigration. And also there would have been, arguably some families would have stayed together instead of you know, kids leaving home and flatting and all that sort of stuff. But as a general rule, you had a big drop off on it. But at, over the last five years, from 2017, 2021, we're building more houses. So we're not building enough houses. So in 2020, when prices went up, as you can see, the demand for houses was 42,000 houses, but only 37,000 were, were supplied. That's 5,000 people who can't find a house to buy, prepared to pay more. And that's one of the reasons that jacks up house prices. But have a look at it in 2021. Demand for 12,000, supply of 44,000. As long as house prices remain this high, people will be incentivized to build them and sell them. And so the one 
good piece of news out there, in spite, I think, of inflation and so on, is that we are actually building more houses, and that is likely to at least subdue house price growth. Maybe it will cause it to flatten out. Maybe it will cause it to go down. Long term, the trend is for them to go up. So long term, our advice on buying a house is the same as always. Buy it as soon as you can, buy a house as soon as you can, and pay it off as soon as you can. It's a tax-free capital gain. Remember, simplicity is a nonprofit. We don't make any money from you doing that. We don't make any money at all, but uh, we don't make money from you doing that. So our advice is, by all means, have your KiwiSaver and your investment funds and so on, but owning your house is still the best investment you can make long term. But it does show that long term, the supply of houses is increasing, and therefore, the prices are likely to go up less strongly in the future. But here is our prediction for where house prices go. We don't make a predict. We have no, Andrew, do you have any idea where house prices are going? Not, you, not at all. You know, we don't know, folks. We have no idea. But we do know that if you look at in history, there is a very, very strong indicator in history that over the time that you own a house and, and, and over your lifetime, it is very likely to go up as long as the population continues to go up, as long as we continue to get more productive, and as long as we continue to make more money. And the rise of KiwiSaver all by itself is going to be an indicator that that is likely to happen. So the very strong trends are that it will go up over time, regardless of what happens short term. And even if you think you can pick the short term in this, so I'm going to wait for it to go down. In history, only in 2008, and only for one year, did house prices go down. So if you are able to time that perfectly, good on you, wonderful, I'm sure some people did. But that's a very, very difficult market to time perfectly, yeah? Very hard to do. So what we've talked about, we'll have lots of time for questions now, is inflation and its impact. It's come, folks. It's not as dramatic as people think it is or the headlines would indicate, but it does mean that it is going to affect financial markets, which it's doing right now. Stock markets going down, bond markets going down, people nervous unsure about the future and financial markets hate uncertainty. Um, but uh, long term, we think it is likely to be likely to, to be got under control because of supply side issues will be handled. The cost cost of doing things in the world will go down, particularly as we get um, over COVID and people start moving around more. What can I do? stay in the strategy or the fund that if it was good good for you a year or two or three years ago it's very likely to be good for you now um and and so do not uh succumb to this loss aversion do not operate out of fear operate out of opportunity and and you know and and and, and out of the trends that have worked for you in the past stay diversified pay the lowest fees and you'll be okay and then house prices They've gone up massively. History indicates that they will continue to go up over time. But there are some forces now in terms of the supply of housing, which indicates it will be a more subdued market with more power going back to buyers. Mortgage rates are likely to go up along with inflation. That will also put a dampener on house prices as well. Where they will go, we don't know, but history would indicate that it will be a little bit more under control than people's worst fears. So, folks, I'm going to stop right now there. And, Andrew, you're the question master. So uh, let's rip into it. Yeah. Um, thanks, Sam. And thank you, everybody, for your questions. Um, a couple of things we should have said right at the very beginning, um, if you like housekeeping. Um, the Q&A function is the better one to send us questions. Early on, people were putting them on chat. Um, and although we can get to those, it's easier to do the Q&As. Um, but I would just go through a couple of these. Um, because there are some general themes here. Um, the first and most notable one is, is the, the one we always have to say, unfortunately, is that we can't give you personal advice. Um, there's various people asking whether they should be switching out of growth, switching into balance, whatever. Um, the overall comment from us is, as Sam said, is that we believe long-term, the most risk you can take will give you the best returns over a long period of time. So our growth fund is, is, is where you should be if you want to be invested for the long-term. But that's simply based on the general principle that shares go up over time. Um, if you want personalized advice, I'm afraid you have to go to, a, to an advisor. Um, and another question that's come through from a few different people, um, which was early on in the piece, was just the com composition of the CPI, which I agree with a number of you that it really doesn't reflect necessarily what the average 
It may, it may, it may actually reflect what the average household experiences over any period of time. But it's fairly, um, yeah, it's difficult. I think it's an extremely difficult thing to gauge and they don't change the CPI basket very often. If you are only talking about things like, well, house prices, petrol, um, various other sort of individual things that some people spend more on than others, um, food prices, they're all, they all move differently. So that CPI average is an extremely imperfect tool. So, I mean, it's not under our control, of course, um, but, is, is inflation actually higher than reported? Possibly in some areas, it, it probably isn't. Um, but fundamentally, what we're saying is that inflation is more of an issue at the moment than it has been for a very long time. But we believe that if you stay invested, stay the course, you'll still do, do as well as you can. Um, and the final question in the chat for me to quickly address, Sam, um, which was one right at the end from, from Glenn, um, do you think this is what Jeremy Grantham calls a super bubble? Um, we don't think so. And he's got his opinion. Um, our view is that as, we, as we've said many times, nobody really knows. And you can get a lot of publicity for saying something extreme um, in, our, in our particular view. The long-term story is that uh, property prices tend to go higher. And let's say it was, let's, let's use the worst example. Let's say it is a super bubble and the bubble bursts and it's all over. That means that we're in for, you know, 10 years of tough times in terms of financial market returns. Well, for most people, that doesn't matter. Most people are investing for longer than 10 years. And actually, it's a fantastic opportunity for people like regular KiwiSaver investors because then they're buying investments cheaper. You know, Warren Buffett says, when financial markets go down, I jump with joy because I get to buy the same things I bought yesterday on sale. Yeah. So the f f for and of course, nobody wants us to go through tough financial times and markets going down. But from an investor's point of view, even if the worst case predictions are right, unless you're predicting the end of humanity, these are, you know, you're not really going to be uh, disadvantaged by going through a period where financial markets go down and financial investments become cheaper to buy over time. That is assuming, of course, that you have a salary and a job. Just want to make one comment about inflation there, Andrew. Like, if you're trying to buy a first home now, like, your inflation rate totally sucks, right? Because the cost of houses just keeps on rising. So totally understand how people can feel way more impoverished or way further away from their financial goals, even when inflation is only 5% if houses keep on rising at this rate. This is, by the way, one of the reasons why we're doing the affordable homes, because we're going to build own and rent long-term at affordable prices, a lot of homes for New Zealanders so that they have another housing option than just having to pay the price to buy an expensive house or you know, forever revolving short-term rents. So, but you know, if people like ourselves are starting to devise uh, solutions to these things, that's overall things, things should be better in the future. Cool. Okay. Well, let me see if we can, how quickly we can work through some of these. Some of them I can, can knock off, I think, fairly quickly. Um, so going right back to the very beginning, um, MB asked us, how do we set our floating rate? Um, because we are not influenced by the OCR. Um, I just want to quickly cover that off because it's, it is a very important point. This is the floating rate for our mortgages. For our, for the, for our, the char what we charge for the mortgages through our mortgage fund. Um, we, we are charged by regulation with acting in the best interests of our investors. And therefore, the rate that we charge has to be the best rate we can make for our investors relative to what else is available. Keeping in mind, of course, it's got to be competitive from the point of view of comparisons with, with where the banks are charging for mortgages. So that's our, that's our balancing. We start off with where else, where else can we get the sort of return that we need? And therefore, is that competitive from a, from a mortgage rate? So each time we reset it, it's a balancing act between those two. Um, we're trying to reset as, as irregularly as we can within reason, but of course, with interest rates going up, we are having to keep monitoring things fairly carefully. But if, because the banks tend to make their changes around the time that the Reserve Bank announce, announces the OCR, it, we will tend to be reviewing them around the same sort of time. But as you rightly say, MB, we're not tied to it to the same degree. And so we have a floating interest rate now of 3.15% for first home buyers. That is, 
that gives our investors, our KiwiSaver members, investment fund members who are supplying this money to lend, that gives them a better return than they would if we put it on fixed interest in the bank. And from the borrowers, they're also paying much less than they would, even on a, so is Andrew, that's still the lowest mortgage rate so. in the country. I'd rather not say that. Yeah, Categorically, it's yes. certainly one of, if not the lowest mortgage rate in the country. And yet that is, act, so that's giving for borrowers, our members who are borrowers, it's fantastic. It means they can pay off their home faster, but it also delivers more, more, more money to investors. Why? Because there's no bank in the middle taking a profit. Right, and that's why. So just completely eliminate the banks, have members lending to members, and that's how it works. Every everybody wins, the banks lose. We're very happy with that. Um, okay, moving on. So an answer to Graham: uh, What is Simplicity's uh, business continuity plan when we're all set with Omicron? Um, <laughs> essentially, Graham. Yeah, we we when we set our business up, we were very very conscious of the fact that we wanted to be online, we wanted to be able to work from home. Um, and so our entire business for three months worked with nobody in the office at all. Um, and we can operate in that way. Um, as I say, we, it was designed that way. Um, if we're actually sick from what we've seen elsewhere, and we've got almost personal experience to this, um, there might be a day or two when you're actually incapacitated, but actually you, you'll be able to function. So we're not, uh, we're not too worried about it. Anything you want to add, Sam? And we have lots of employees and all the necessary computer backup systems. I mean, we were just made a default KiwiSaver provider. And so obviously, of course, the government spends a lot of time looking at that and making sure that we're industrial strength in that area. It's a very valid question. But um, the other thing I'd say is we've almost been through the last two years, we've almost been through a test run, right? Because we've effectively been operating that way for huge periods of time. So the next is a question from Anonymous, which is any thoughts on, on the Omicron wave on New Zealand and investment? I think we've covered that off. Is there anything you want to say specifically, Sam, about the, if you like, what we're about to experience, we think? Uh, look, I'm actually, an, I'm by nature, an optimist. I actually think Omicron might be actually, funnily enough, quite good for the economy because the thing that I think is holding back the economy now most is the closure of the borders and labour mobility and what it's doing to the tourist industry and so on. We need people picking fruit, but we also need tourists coming in and so on. So the faster Omicron um, occurs now and the faster we get over it, then the faster the borders open up and the better off for the economy it is. So unlike Delta or other variants where we thought we could eliminate it by closing the borders, the word seems to be that we cannot eliminate this. It's arriving, it's going to happen, in which case there'll be no reason to have closed borders, in which case the economy will pick up. I hope so anyway. Um, uh, Malcolm, is it possible to get copies of the slides? Um, I believe so. I think we're putting those up. Um, I've answered the CPI question um, and I've answered the next one. Sorry. What were the conditions that caused the fear downturn in the market, which was in the shot in the, in the 1960s? Um, I was trying to remember that, Sam. It was uh, even before you and I's time. It was. Um, I can't remember, sorry, we'd have to it look was, back. And the, yeah, it was, it was sort of post-war hangover. There was the initial bounce mm. and then it all fell very flat for a while. Well, but, there was um, also a commodity price crisis in, in the 60s, uh, which may have hurt New Zealand because we were so dependent on the price of butter and lamb being sold into the UK market. I think there was also the first thing things of the UK entering the European economic zone at that stage of late 60s because they entered in 1972 from memory so uh, there would have been some hangover there as well that would have been a pretty big shock to us yeah but that was your u.s share market chart oh it was the right. u.s share market in the 60s oh goodness oh well, yeah and you had a whole bunch of stuff here but you had the the vietnam war you had some inflation shocks that happened there it depends where it was in the 60s sorry but it was a pretty volatile time um great have music you wanted Right. Yes, we we come back to that one. Um, do you want to comment at all about Bitcoin, Sam? Um, yeah. Any questions on that? Look, uh, we get this question about crypto all the time. Are we invested in crypto? No. Uh, why? Because cryptocurrencies, in our opinion, are, are it's gambling, not investing. Um, you know, and it's perfectly fair if people want to invest in it. We love the blockchain and the underlying technology, but the uh, the the very essence of a crypto coin is an unregulated, untaxed environment, and we don't invest in unregulated, untaxed industries because the predictability of them is, is well, they're just so unpredictable. And if they're really successful, they will become regulated and will become taxed. In which case, we may get involved at that point. 
So I guess that would be our s- summation: is that is that uh, we know there's a lot of amazing zealots, and it's been a roller coaster ride, and a lot of money's been made and lost in that process. But until such time as it's legal, and it's not, we won't we won't do it. Um, I will make a quick comment. Thank you for your question and about uh, Simplicity's conservative funds' recent return relative to other conservative funds. Um, it is disappointing. The reason for that is that we've got more money invested in longer term bonds than the average conservative fund. That, but that's, again, because we believe in the long term, holding longer term bonds um, is better for investors. And we still believe that over a long period of time, that will be the case. But in the short term and even over the last three years, with rising interest rates, that has hurt us a wee bit. Um, it's not, not, not been a disaster. We're still in the uh, the top few percentile for five years, but um, it, it's been a bit painful short term. We believe it will come right over time. And, and that's indicative. So short term, we're going to suffer every now and again because we believe in the long term trend, but long term we win. You know, uh, we are never the hare in investing. We're always the tortoise because we know who wins in the end. Um, so very, very, again, very quickly, because we could go on for a lot about bonds. Um, a question, an anonymous question is why, walk, walk us through why we hold them. Um, the returns are terrible. The returns are terrible and over the short term. But um, the reason that our conservative funds were outperforming everybody for the first three years of their life was because we held longer bonds. Um, and it's just been more painful in the last year or so. Um, the long-term fixed rate in New Zealand is sort of 2, 2.6, 2.8, somewhere up there now. Um, and actually over a long period of time, that's a perfectly reasonable return from uh, long-term bonds. We hold them because in normal circumstances, they uh, they even out the big swings that you get in riskier markets. Um, uh, but for our growth funds, it's a very small holdings, less than 20% of the fund is in bonds of any sort. Um, in the conservative funds, it's a lot higher. And for that reason, over the recent past, it's uh, it's been that bit more painful. I don't and think also, not. also Andrew, we wouldn't be investing in them if they weren't offering a fair return for the risk, right? Which is what they are. So they're incredibly low risk, backed by the government. And for that, you get a lower return for sure. But there's some room for very, very low risk investments in all portfolios. So that's, that's why we invest in them. And also we can liquidate them easily. We can easily money to pay back people who want to take their money out at any time by government bonds. Um, Quite, we'll keep working through these. Um, Question that I can answer very easily. Um, Are we still, from Anonymous again, are we still planting a fee for each member? And yes, we are. Um, How many have we planted so far, Sam? Well, I think we've funded about 80,000 trees now. And um, we're also, in our affordable housing, we're going to be offsetting all the carbon in the construction uh, of those houses by planting. I think it's about 200 native trees per apartment uh, offsets the carbon generated by the materials and the labor and transport that goes into the building of the apartment. So yeah, look, we have a big hairy goal of planting over a million native trees. Um, And also obviously in the environment is a big focus for our charity. So we're also looking at a whole bunch of other environmental projects as well. And have actually funded quite a few and pest eradication and so on and so forth, or pest control, I should say. So um, yeah, that's that's what we're doing. It It's great. Thank you, Sam. Um, how much money would I have made if I missed the 10 worst days or more more or less than missing the 10 best days? I mean, a really good question from somebody anonymous. Um, but our point there is largely simply that you're better being in the market the whole time because you can't pick 10 days out of 10 years. Whether you get the best ones or the worst ones is not the point. The point is you're better off being in the market the whole way through. Um, Sorry, Sam, anything you want to add? No, absolutely right. Okay. Um, It's it's specific. Go on, you go. It's it's like parenting. If you want to raise the best kid, just be present for them every day of their lives. That'd be fantastic. See the lines of communication (laughs) open. Absolutely. Um, Why do you think tech stocks in America are taking such a big hit right now? Do you think NZ tech stocks may follow suit? little bit specific i will give you a very personal view on that which is not the company view if you like but from my point of view the tech stocks were just getting to the point that they were not really reflecting fundamentals um and uh you you can't justify the sort of valuations they were getting to so it was just just a little bit overbought there's been a correction they're still fundamentally extremely 
most of those stocks are backed by companies that are very, very uh, good long term. Um, it's just a correction. Here's, a, here's a, fun, a fun fact, folks. We have a morning meeting and we, we have a little fun fact some days. When Steve Jobs left Apple, it was worth $200 billion. It was recently hit $3 trillion, 15 times the value that when he left. Now, is that fair or not? We don't know. You know, you can have a view saying maybe they're a little bit overcooked, but it sort of shows you the massive run-up in value that these, uh, that these companies have had. Uh, a lot of it justified. But if you think that Steve Jobs was, he was certainly the making of Apple initially, but most of the shareholder value has been generated after he left. Um, and I mean, in terms of NZ tech stocks, sorry, I, I don't have a, a view and we, we don't really pick stock. So ours is just basically stay invested. Um, and to a degree, this is a question that's come through from Facebook from uh, Natalia. Um, should we stop making contributions to growth and balance funds at the moment since the market is dropping? I mean, actually, our, our message, Natalia, is, is the opposite. Now is a good time to be investing because you're getting these, um, uh, the prices are lower. So you're getting things, as, as Sam said, almost at sale value relative to where they were at the end of the year. Um, and over the long period of time, um, it, it's called cost averaging. You, you, you're actually getting into uh, the same investments at a lower price. So over a long period of time, that works in your favor when they go up. And uh, Natalia, think about the financial markets like, I don't know, a smartphone. If you want the smartphone and having the smartphone is great for you, if it goes on sale, you're going to want it even more, right? So as Warren Buffett said, when markets go down, I rejoice. I get to buy the same companies I wanted to buy yesterday at a cheaper price. Why should I not be more, why should I not be happy about that? And so as a, as a general rule, don't worry about the short-term paper losses you might, think, you might think you're making. Think about the opportunity for you to be contributing and buying more of those companies at cheaper prices. Thanks, Sam. Um, question from Grant, and being a boomer, this is uh, almost ain't targeted at me. The rising tide idea is good, but won't the boomers take that money out at some stage and our population isn't growing enough to cover that? Um, it's a really good question when we don't make predictions about markets, but from my point of view, the predictions about aging population and so on have been the case and for, for such a long period of time now. Um, and mar markets and populations and countries and economies adjust. Um, so yes, that's a, a good point, Grant, but I think um, over time, as I say, the world will open up properly and New Zealand will no longer be isolated and then um, things will just move. Here's a perspective for you too, Grant. Total value of KiwiSaver, let's call it $80 billion. Total value of residential property, $1.7 trillion, 20 times as much. What happens when all of these boomers like us, Andrew, you and I, what happens when we sell our house, downsize the house and have money to invest in the markets? So the massive release of wealth from real estate over time back into financial markets will be, that'll be quite a big trend. Well, it sort of feeds onto the next question, which is anonymous about um, when the border opens, I'm hoping it will be less than one, three, five years, um, and demand constraints will further push up house prices, should we buy as soon as we can. And Sam's, our overall advice is that from our point of view, your house is not really an investment in the same way as putting money in KiwiSaver and investment funds is, it's where you want to live. Um, and if you've got the opportunity to buy a house, in our view, that's worked out very well for New Zealand's population for a very long period of time. It's not, we, we, we don't see it as an investment decision. It's a, it's much more of a personal decision. Do you know what, I, I just one other ob observation, Andrew, let me ask you the question. Have you ever met anyone who said that buying their house, that they bought their house at the wrong time? Oh, no, I doubt it, no. Because the long-term trend is the house prices go up, they forget if, you know, maybe house prices went flat or down a half of a cent or 1% three months after they bought it, right? So at the time of it, it's long forgotten in the house price appreciation over time. So, the you know, we, we, we have a whole lot, we have, we, at Simplicity here, 
we hear a whole lot more heartbroken stories about people who thought they could time the market and have waited, waited, waited to put down a deposit, draw down on their KiwiSaver funds to buy their funds, and the house prices raced up against them. You know, there's a whole lot more heartbreaking stories. I've never heard one who said, oh, I paid too much. I wish I'd waited. I could have paid less. And in, in, in history, there are very few circumstances where that's true. Uh, so, Joseph, thank you for your question um, and uh, appreciate the, the compliments. Um, we've, yes, we've removed any uh, dollar fees from our uh, charges, um, and, but you're absolutely right. Reducing the, the fund fee, the percentage of total funds will benefit customers more over, over time. And we assure you, Joseph, that's exactly what we intend to do as soon as we can. Um, yeah. We're growing, which is great for our members because that means we can reduce our funds, uh, our fees um, over time. Anything to add, Dan? Yeah, look, our, our fees are what we call 0.3 of a percent effectively, what 31 basis points if you understand the terminology. But so $3.10 for every $1,000 invested. The average fee charge by our competitors is about three or four times that. Uh, average is about three and a bit times that. But you know what? Our competitors look at our fees and say, oh, they're so cheap. Sometimes they'll say they're too cheap. We look at our fees and say they're too high. We want them to go down, which is why we completely eliminated member fees. That was about, just to give you an idea, that cut our revenue by about 13%. And, you know, a normal fund manager would have taken that as profit and gone off and bought another boat or whatever they do with their money we give it back to members. So, and we're just gonna carry on doing that. That's why we ask you to please tell your friends because the more scale we get, the more we can lower our fees, which is more money in your pocket to give you choices and dignity in life. And so, you know, that's our mantra. That's what we're doing. We're now saving $39 million a year in fees for members versus the average fee charged by, by KiwiSaver funds. So that is, you know, it's, it's an awful lot of money. It's you know, I mean, hopefully by the end of this year, it'll be a million dollars a week that we're putting back into Kiwi's pockets in terms of fee savings. Thanks, Sam. Um, a question from Sammy. I heard that investing repeated small amounts over time is recommended over lump sums. Is that true? Which would you recommend? Uh, the reality is, Sammy, that that's correct um, because otherwise you're, you've got the danger of buying on a, on a bad day, I guess. Um, if you're just continually dollar cost averaging um, over time, that that is a more sensible way to invest in general. Um, Sam, anything? No, think about think about investing like you, you were saving as a kid, you know, you put in, save a little bit each week and use the power of compounding interest to work for you. But that's true. The dollar cost averaging is a another free gift in financial markets. Yeah. Um, anonymous question, given overall growth in KiwiSaver funds, is it better for someone not not requiring access to KiwiSaver, for example, retired to invest only in Simplicity KiwiSaver or spread it between KiwiSaver and investment funds. Um, they're, they're both exactly the same. The KiwiSaver growth conservative balance is exactly is invested exactly the same way as our investment funds. So if you're over 65, it actually doesn't matter to you whether you're in the investment funds or the KiwiSaver. There's no difference at all. The, and that's in terms of the, the investments and the fees. The one advantage of KiwiSaver is that you can get a government contribution. So if you invest $1,042 a year as an adult, the government will give you an additional $521. That is why one of the greatest gifts you can give your friends is to make sure that they are all in KiwiSaver. Some of them say, listen, I'm a tradie, I'm self-employed, it's not good, that's fine. You invest in your money, invest in your business, whatever, but make sure you put in $1,042 into KiwiSaver every year because you will get free money from the government, $521. There are hundreds of millions of dollars a year not claimed by New Zealanders in terms of government subsidies who would be eligible. So whatever you do as an adult, and whatever your friends do as adults, whatever your kids do once they turn 18, they must have a KiwiSaver account. And just think about it this way, stick in 20 bucks a week. If you put in 20 bucks a week, the government will give you another $10 a week effectively. Unfortunately, that doesn't apply to you if you are over 65 necessarily, but- um, You are, sorry, between 18 and 65, apologies, Andrew, you're right. No, well, that was, yeah. Um, 
question I don't know the answer to. What percentage of consented properties actually result in a property being built within three years? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And I don't have the number, but anecdotally, we do know that a lot of consented properties don't get built. And we think in this time, that's likely to happen again because the financing charges will be too high. Banks are withdrawing some lending because it's too risky and some property developers. I don't know if you know this, folks, but the average amount made on a residential property development by the developer, particularly if they're a small-scale developer, is somewhere between 2 and 5%. Very thin margins. So if building material costs go up, if financing costs go up, if something goes wrong on the building site, quite often these things cannot get built or they can stop or, or stop getting built. And then the banks have to come in and act as receivers and so on. So um, the consent is a very good sign, but it doesn't, you know, the reality is the bricks and mortar. And only when the houses are actually available for sale or for rent, will that have the pressure on prices to hold down prices and hold down rents. So what we've seen is an encouraging start because of the consents, but you're right, they do have to turn into actual builds. Thanks, Sam. Um, uh, Christian from Johan currently has currently has two hundred thousand dollars in the growth fund. Um, should I should it leave it there or buy property? That's an investment decision, Johan. Um, we we can't give you an advice give you advice on that. Um, I don't know if you want to make any comments, Sam, but no. unfortunately, no. just uh, sorry, Johan. That's that's very very personal to you. Yeah. Um, question that keeps moving around for me. Um, are we cons from in, are we considering expanding the uh, home loan scheme beyond first home buyers to existing borrowers? Sam, you got a comment on that? Uh, not at this stage because we have plenty of demand for from first home buyers and we would like um, them, well, there's the several reasons why we restrict to first home buyers. First of all is if we opened it up to everybody, demand would be well beyond our ability to lend, right? We'd have to be as big as a bank to satisfy that demand. Secondly, um, uh, uh, we would also be lending to people who are probably higher risk than first home buyers. Uh, the first home buyers are the most reliable uh, repayers because, of course, it's their home, right? And they've got to have a roof over their heads. So that's very good for our investors as well. It would be more expensive if we were lending. Uh, we would have to sort of up our mortgage rates a bit. But the bottom line is we have plenty of demand from first home buyers. We think we're doing the most good earning the fairest returns and taking the lowest risk doing that. So not at this stage. Um, and I promise you, as soon as we open that up, I mean, if we did it, we'd have to do it very selectively um, because we would be at 3.15%, we'd be swamped with demand. Thanks, Ed. Um Question from Joseph, interesting one. What's your opinion about exposure to commodity and precious metals? Are there any plans for us to provide an exposure to them? Um, Sam, do you want to cover that? Well, you, you could chip in, Andrew. I, I think, you know, as a separate asset class, of course, a, an awful lot of the companies we're invested in are effectively exposed to commodities and precious metals. I mean, we have, you know, we have the, the, the 3,000 biggest companies in the world in our portfolio. A lot of those are mining companies, precious metal companies, and so on. So we're effectively exposed to them that way without it having to need to have a, a separate asset class. No, and um, I think, as you say, Sam, from our our point of view, um, commodities are are a subset of uh, of the market, which is yeah notoriously volatile. We'd rather have that rising tide of of share markets over a long period of time. Um, question from David, which to a degree I'm thinking about it while I'm sitting here, um, which came through from Facebook, I think. In in any other market, the growth rate makes housing look like a bubble propped up by artificial scarcity and historical reasons. Um, so I'll, I'll start with this one, Sam, because it just occurred to me while I was listening, reading it that you, you, you're right, David, and, and certainly if you look at the slope of the graph and so on over uh, that Sam was showing, it looks sort of bubblish. However, the real question in my mind is always what's going to burst it? And when I say burst it, why would property prices in New Zealand drop dramatically? I'm not saying that, and Sam said that we think that that rate will, will probably slow, um, but the only reason that it's going to suddenly collapse would be either demand disappears completely or alternatively a massive amount of supply comes on um, and I just can't see why either of those two factors is likely um, in the foreseeable future. Anything from you Sam? Yeah look uh, if they drop dramatically it will be something we don't know about as Andrew said it'll be a black swan event right so um, for example the New Zealand economy tanked when uh, Britain 
announced it was joining the European Union. Unforeseeable, right? So it could happen, but it won't be in a predictable manner. If, if it drops dramatically, it'll be a surprise to everybody. And you know, the only defense you have against that is diversification and, and, and low fees. Those are the only two things that you can do to protect yourself against things you can't predict, right? Um, yeah. But you're right, Andrew, I don't think there's anything in the foreseeable market levers which would cause a dramatic drop in prices. But it could still happen. Um, an honest question, how do we define long term with regard to investments? Um, hmm. I can give you the, the almost the prescriptive answer, um, which is that our sort of recommended minimum time frame for our growth fund, for example, is at least 10 years, um, shorter for balanced and conservative, but sort of five to seven years for those. Um, uh, however, I, I guess I look at long term as being saving for yeah, 15, 20, 30 years, the, the real long term, where you, you're confident that the short-term fluctuations fall out. Sam, you want to expand on that? Well, you know, we're a whole-of-life company, so we hope that uh, if some of you have a child, that we will be with your family and supporting you from the day they're born till the day they pass away. So we've deliberately built as a 100-year-plus company. To give you some perspective, the affordable homes we're building will be built to double the building code. So we're building, building code says you need to build a house for 50 years. We're building them to last 100 years because we fully expect to own them for 100 years and be renting them very much as pension funds do in France and Spain and Germany and England, where families live intergenerationally and rent from the same pension fund that's owned them, you know, across generations. So um, we'd like to, you know, start that process in New Zealand. So that's how long term we think. Yeah. I'm going to rattle through this. Thank you, Felicity, for your comment, um, which was complimentary about what you're up to, Sam. Um, mm -hmm. Comment from Avon through Facebook. Um, apparently, ANZ Economics didn't publish a CPI forecast in their latest media release. Um, I mean, I've got a lot of respect for the ANZ Economics team. Um, I can't remember that they missed one out. But if they did, it won't be because they don't have one. Um, their view is inflation is still under a wee bit of pressure from what I remember, but uh, can't go can't go a lot beyond that, I'm afraid, um, Avon. Um, question from Peter, um, which unfortunately we're not going to be able to answer in detail, but which is I'm a retiree, I haven't the time for funds to increase over five to 10 years. I'm in a balanced fund and have another six finger sum to invest. Any comments? I, how do you address that, Sam? It's it's so yeah, Peter, look, That's a very personal thing. I, I would say this generally about retirees, though, is do not um, underestimate how long you will live. I think statistically, if someone lives till there, I mean, get these numbers wrong, folks, but it's in the order of this magnitude that if you live to 60, the chances of you living to 90 are very high indeed. So, um, or, or way higher than you think. So most people need to make their money last longer. And as a general rule, if you don't need it all at once, as a general rule, the mistake I think most people make is to stick it in overly conservative investments, thinking that they want to protect their capital, only to have it earn them less money over time to give them less money to live on in retirement. So as long as you have a very diversified pool of investments, you can afford to be in balanced and growth funds as a retiree, because you won't need all of the money all at once. So if markets go down, you're still just taking the same weekly, fortnightly, monthly withdrawal, and you can afford for markets return. So how do I think about this personally? I only have two investments. I own my home. Well, actually, I own my car, my home, my car, and my KiwiSaver account with simplicity because um, I believe in eating um, our own cooking, right? So all of our investments are simplicity. But I've got that in a growth fund, and I'm going to have it in a growth fund until I'm well into my 70s because I want that to carry on earning me money so I can draw down on that. Again, I won't need it all at once. It's very personal to your circumstances, but as a general comment, I would say, uh, elderly people and people in retirement need to get comfortable with owning more balanced and growth assets as long as it is very diversified and they don't need the money all at once. Great, thanks, Sam. Um, an honest question again about the, the housing market. Um, and I just broadly just state here that um, is it, it's coming feeding back into what happens, how can people afford it? We are very focused, as Sam has said, on, on building a lot of rental properties, which are far more affordable than they currently are. We still got to work towards investment returns, but we believe that rents um, will generate 
decent returns from building to rent um, over a long period of time. So we're hoping that we can have an impact on housing inflation and, and moot it. I still don't, as I've said, I, unless something un, unforeseen happens, I can't see what's going to cause it to burst. But at the same time, we are going to try and slow down that, um, that, that increase in house prices. Andrew, can I ask you a question? Can you ever remember a time in your life when houses were cheap? Houses are always expensive. Folks, I remember the time I was driving along as a student in a Fiat Bambina, one of Fiat 500s, along Ponsonby Road, and I switched on AM radio. There wasn't even FM radio. AM radio, and it said, a house has just sold in Ponsonby for $100,000. First house ever sold for $100,000. And I remember thinking, that is absolutely crazy. They are mad. Those prices are insane. Houses never seem cheap. They never, ever, ever seem cheap. And so, yes, yeah, so, so, you know, and that sort of something I sort of impart to the young people, it will always seem expensive because it always has. Yeah, I mean, I remember a conversation when I first arrived in New Zealand in the mid 90s with uh, my colleague at the time, and he, he was a firm believer that the house market, housing market was overvalued, um, felt that it was something of a bubble. And that was near 1994, 95. So, it's 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 unfortunately it's just yeah fact of life that in New Zealand there there is always seem to be a slight that yeah you know, demand has exceeded supply. Is he that prominent active fund manager that we both know, Andrew? <laughs> He's not actually, but anyway, okay, a different one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, in regards to well, this is this one came through earlier, um, Helen. Thank you. Um, in regards to a withdrawal funds, are other funds withdrawn from the least performing shares at the time or taken randomly from the portfolio? Um, in general, um, we we are a buy and hold investor and, and because we're growing, we generally don't have to actually redeem anything from anywhere. However, if we were in a situation that we were withdrawing money out of the funds, it's not done randomly at all. It's taken equally from the fund across the board so if you like if if it were possible we would be selling a very small number of 3,000 shares we're invested in pools of money so that we can do it far more easily than that but fundamentally no it's not taken randomly and it's certainly not taking from either the best or the least performing it's taken completely across the portfolios um Kim what's a super bubble good question I mean I don't know how you'd actually define it but I guess you'd look at the 2008 GFC and say that was a super bubble where that where where fundamentals have got completely thrown out the window. People are investing in things that actually had no real value at all, um, and suddenly the, the emperor had no clothes. Suddenly it was naked, and and the, the the true value was reflected in a sudden disappearance of uh, of of umpteen billions and billions of dollars. Anything you add, Sam? Well, Andrew, you and I have both been through these in the past, right? I remember when I was working overseas, we were listing in the first internet bubble of 2000, we were listing companies like pets.com or Asia, asiainternet.com and all these crazy companies with no revenue for huge valuations because everyone thought the internet was going to be you know, the next best thing. It was, but people usually overestimate the impact of new technologies in the short term and underestimate it in the long term. So um, I don't know, Andrew, I mean, I look at some tech companies now and I think, how are they ever going to make any money? So maybe they're in a little bit of a bubble, but, you know, the fundamentally, the listed companies, the companies that are making money and doing things and every single day, there doesn't seem to be a massive disconnect. But listen, we don't predict the future of these cycles because that's a lottery. You know, they go up and down. We just know that in the long term, um, if you believe in human endeavor, if you believe in capitalism, if you believe in democracy, financial markets will, will reward you for taking risk in the long term. Um, thanks, Sam. So uh, quick answer to Felicity, if you're still on the call. Um, this this is recorded, I believe it's on Facebook and, and it's on our YouTube channel as well. Um, an anonymous question, what are the instruments worth considering in terms of having a diversified portfolio? Is there best practice in terms of the percentage split? Uh, that's actually a, a reasonably complex question, um, but the the reality is that every major fund managing group and, and the consultants spend a lot of time trying to work out exactly what percentage you should have in each different asset class. Um, we look at all of those people and we take the average of everybody to get our asset allocation. Um, the act, Your actual asset allocation depends on your degree of risk. 
um, between the various growth assets, the shares and income assets such as bonds. Um, so it, it, that, that the, in terms of which asset classes, again, it's open to a massive amount of, of interpretation and, and debate as to how much you should have in international, how much you should have in New Zealand, if at all. Um, there is no answer, I'm afraid, whoever mm. you are. Um, but fundamentally, we make sure that we are we've got a lot in everything. That's our our and, and I guess it's fair to say, Andrew, I mean, you know, as you said, what we do is we look at the top 12 fund managers in New Zealand. They've got all the economists and strategists and everything. We look at what they do, we take the average of what they've done. So we get all of that thinking for free, basically. And we say we're just going to take the average and focus on the thing that we can focus on, which is not trying to pick the direction of financial markets. How can you beat the rest of the world? The charts I've shown you said statistically it's extremely difficult. What we focus on are the things we can control, which is charging you the lowest fee, making it as diversified as possible, and, and being patient and letting those long-term trends work for you. As I say, it's the tortoise strategy. It's not exciting, doesn't make great headlines, doesn't make for you know rah-rah presentations and fancy ads on TV, but the tortoise beats the hare long term. And that's about making you wealthier to give you more choices and dignity in life. It's as simple as that. Thanks, Sam. Um, this is a little bit, yeah, like I'll read the question because it's interesting, but I'm afraid the answer is going to be a little bit non-committal. What's your view on closed international borders and its impact on New Zealand economy, including tourism? In the US, the likes of Warren, Warren, Gates and Bezos are trying to fix the healthcare system. Perhaps after housing, Simplicity and others should try to fix our broken healthcare system, thus stop the government from putting band-aids. Yeah, appreciate the sentiments. Um, Sam, have you got any comment? Oh, look, we won't comment on the health system or anything like that. There are private operators doing that already, like Southern Cross and so on and so forth. So, and as a general, we won't do things that the government does because, you know, governments get elected by people to do those things and not us. Um, but in terms of the closed borders, yeah, look, I think we're getting to the point, this is just my personal view, I think we're getting to the point now where closed borders are really going to start hurting the economy because economic performance is a relative thing. So when the rest of the world opens up and people can move freely amongst borders, you're going to start to see some pretty bad damage to things like our education system, tertiary education system, because students will choose to go elsewhere in the world, not come to New Zealand, because it's hard, very difficult in um, some of the labour dependent markets, as we mentioned fruit picking before, but there's a whole lot of people where we rely on um, um, people coming in from overseas to do our jobs and also the very skilled jobs as well. You know, there's a whole lot of people who just cannot get in. So I think in the tourist industry, of course, is an obvious one there as well. So um, we need to open our borders. New Zealand has got rich by having open borders, right? Trading goods, trading services, people coming and going, immigration. It is, a, in my mind, a very naive view to think that we can somehow maintain our and grow our prosperity by not having open borders because our entire history says exactly the opposite. Yeah, <clears throat> completely agree. Um, question from Kim, please explain the CPI. Um, I mean, that, that's so it's a simple yeah. concept, but it's quite complex. But it's essentially, Kim, um, the, the statistic in New Zealand monitors the price of a, what's called a basket of goods, which is supposed to represent what the average consumer spends on goods each month, year, um, and so on. Um, and then they monitor the prices and they create an index which says this is how much general prices are going up. Um, but it's, as I said earlier in this piece, um, it's, it's open to a lot of interpretation. People obviously have very different um, uh, lists of things that they buy each week uh, and it varies massively depending on the demographics of the, of the population. So it's a very imperfect tool, um, but it is supposed to measure measure the, uh, the, the the current rate of inflation. Anything you... Yeah, and it, look, and it doesn't include house prices, which is a massive swing factor, right? Because a whole lot of people's price of living has gone up, but they've also made a lot of money on their house. But the problem is when they sell their house, they've got to buy another house or they've got to help their kids get into another house. So, you know, it, it, it's a very, as Andrew says, it's a very blunt tool, isn't it, Andrew? But, but at least it's a benchmark for what things cost. But how often do you replace your mobile phone a year? You know, how much do you spend on internet? Everybody's different. Yeah. 
Tolling. Um, another question from Avon from Facebook, which I think we've covered, which was thoughts on the future of cryptocurrency. Um, I think we've, we've covered that one already. Um, well, very simply, I think it'll get regulated and taxed and it'll become part of the mainstream. Um, I think that's what, what will happen. Either that or it will fade away. But if it becomes even more relevant, governments are going to start regulating and taxing it. Um, this one feeds into a theme of yours at the moment, Sam. Um, somebody who's just retired, um, and you're right, you know, having a, if there were to be an extended flat period in or down in growth assets, uh, it's not an attractive proposition if you're retired. Have mm. we got any strategies for retirees? Well, look, I think we are looking at can we provide an income product which provides better than term deposit rates, which is very reliable and safe um, and uh, and provide a you know, much more regular income, knowing that you don't have to go into growth assets like shares or whatever. So we're having a serious look at that. I think we have an idea of how we can. It would have to be, you know, very long term, very reliable, very safe and very scalable. So leave that with us. But it's top of my mind is that there's a whole lot of retirees out there who just don't feel comfortable in anything other than term deposits, but basically get ripped off by the banks who take their money, stick a 2% margin on it typically, and then lend it out as a mortgage, which is one of the reasons why banks make $5 billion a year or have made $5 billion of after tax profit even more before tax so how do we how do we create something that is great for retirees in terms of income while substantially protecting their capital so leave that with us it says andrew says it's top of the mind at the moment um which is actually to a degree at least feeds on to a question from tony which is similarly that he's retired and had some spare cash he could add to his managed fund but it's likely to lose money short term well that's that's open to opinion uh, am I better putting it at a bank term term investment for six months? Tony, unfortunately, we, we can't give personal advice on, on specifics like that. But to be honest, if fundamentally, if it's money you cannot afford to lose, then don't take any risk. Um, very quick answer to this one. Well done on becoming a default provider. Your fees are not the lowest in the default providers why is that or have i got that wrong no you haven't got that wrong um yes there is one entity out there that that charged even less but we're we're gonna get there as soon as we can anything you want to add sam well yeah look it was a bidding process one one of our competitors who otherwise charges much higher fees uh than we do uh decided to um basically uh, i don't know price it at a, a price at which the government could not refuse and that was their their business motivation but it's one fund every one of their other funds charges more than we do so we're certainly the lowest overall provider i think in terms of fees well i think i'm pretty sure we are um and and certainly we aim to be so and look we've got a non-profit high-tech scalable business so in theory we should be the lowest fee provider overall which i think overall we are at the moment um Next question again is, is about being able to access this. Yes, the it's not available on our website, but it's available on our YouTube channel and I believe on Facebook too. Um, quick answer to Stevie, why does it take over two days for an investment payment to show in my account and buy units? Um, Stevie, although the money is invested immediately, it takes two days for us to actually determine the, the value of those of that investment because markets have to close, the price has to be determined, it takes two days. It's a bit frustrating that it takes two days to go through that whole process, but it's a fairly standard unit trust um, process. Mm -hmm. um, but as I say, if you're putting money in, the day that your money hits your account is the date that it's invested. It just takes us two days to value the investments um, as at that point. Um, I'll, I'll quickly... This one from Chris is interesting. Sam's talked about how stupid it was and Muldoon got rid of the superannuation corporation, how much richer New Zealand would be now if that had if it if it had continued, which of course it is. Mm. Um, simplicity heading towards replicating that system. Damn right we are. <laughs> so <laughs> we want to uh yeah, no, good. We, we want to be the biggest farm manager in the country because that will make New Zealanders the wealthiest they possibly can be. Yeah. That's you know, we just like to like to get 
one of the great things about our business is the benefits of scale go right back to members. I think we have cut our fees, Andrew, I'm losing count now. I think we cut our fees four, five times, four, yeah, yeah. four or five times in five years. We're just going to carry on doing it. And, you know, I want my um, personal hallmark of failure is if I get invited to a bank Christmas party. I want to be <laughs> the least popular person in the industry because we just keep on cutting fees keep on forcing the industry fees down which means less money for them and more money for you that is totally what we're about and we give 15 percent of those fees to charity too by the way so charities end up winning we're now giving away uh almost two million dollars a year which is fantastic uh to charities and we just want that to keep on growing too great thanks Frank. uh thanks sam um question from Frank, I'm going to interpret uh, uh, bonds. If long-term interest rates are lowering, can a retired person be overexposed to bonds? Just trying to think that through from a, a conceptual point of view. I mean, if you're if you're retired and you're putting your money into long-term fixed interest, then your money is perfectly, depending on the issuer, your money is perfectly safe. The value of it will fluctuate, but you'll be still receiving the fixed interest payments and, and you'll your values, as I say, not gonna not gonna go down. You'll get what you put in back in the end. Um, in our view, that was not going to be the best investment strategy for you because even a retiree should have some uh, investments in in growth assets um, just to enhance your return. But um, again, everybody's personal circumstances are different, um, and long term interest rates have risen significantly. Um, they're up, as I say, getting up towards 3% now, um, but that's still very low by long-term historical standards, so we, we just don't know where they're going to go from here. Anything you want to add, Sam? Well, look, I think you've hit on a really good point there, Andrew. It doesn't matter what your the value of your bonds might be worth if you had to sell them as a hurried seller on any one day. You'll still get your money back, right? You'll still get your money back. So it's just a patience thing. But yes, most retirees, as Andrew said, should have some money in, in growth assets because it will help your overall returns if you don't need all of your money at once. Uh, if you need all of your money at once, you might have a different view on that. But regardless of that, the bonds are still great things to invest in because you do get your money back. Yeah. Um, question from Ian, how do you evaluate new companies to invest in? I'm interested to understand your process and vetting. Um, so Ian, we don't, uh, if you like, do the evaluation as such. What we do is we follow an index. Um, in the case of our New Zealand shares, which is the smallest portfolio, it's called the Morningstar New Zealand Index. And so Morningstar each quarter do a reconstitution of the index. And if a company has got big enough to be included and become the top 97% of the New Zealand market, that gets included in the index. And if it's included in the index, we'll then buy that, we'll then buy those shares. Any company comes in at a very, very small percentage of the index, so it has almost no material difference to returns and so on initially anyway. Um, but that happens every three months, every six months, uh, that index is reconstituted. Um, and similarly, Vanguard, for all our international share portfolios, do exactly the same. They follow an index. So the only reason a new company comes into the portfolio is generally it's got big enough to be included in the index. Um, and smaller yeah. companies drop out for the same reason. And we do have some small New Zealand companies, though. We have an allocation to Ice House uh, Ventures, oh, sorry, which yeah. is yeah, our uh, venture capital fund. We've got about how much money have we got with Ice House now, Andrew? It'll be 20, about 20 million? 10 up to 20, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's to fund small startup New Zealand companies, which is fantastic. And then we will also be getting a process of selectively investing in some family and privately owned companies in New Zealand, which are very well established, very well known. And because we're a non-profit KiwiSaver fund, we think we have an advantage in terms of we can be a very patient investor along with them th through the generations that their family runs that business. So that's a, a very long patient. Well, it'll take us a long time to invest in that, but that's okay. Time is on our side. And as an investor, time is one of time is your ally. Yeah, but as you say, at the moment that's still a, a very small, very, very small of the amount. overall overall funds. Um, yeah. A question from Charles, which we're not really qualified to answer, but um, I'll, I'll throw it at you anyway, Sam. I'm 83 years of age. I have a son and daughter. Can I leave 50 percent to each when I die? I believe you can. Is there any reason why not? I'm sorry, I don't know. No. 
Um, can you please also check out and answer the question submitted in the chat? Um, okay, I will do that in a moment. Uh, oh, here's another one for us. And um, what, are, what are the succession plans? As we see a lot of gray hair. <laughs> Lovely. Yes, yeah. my hair's gone pretty gray in the last five years. Look, I'm 57, so I could die tomorrow. Uh, anybody can, right? Or I can retire or whatever. My heart is in simplicity, and I'd like to be around here for a little bit longer. But we do have success in plans in place. There are um, at least two people identified who could step straight into my role tomorrow. Uh, you're looking at one of them on the screen there uh, right now. And we have, you know, we have uh, sort of backups as well. People are familiar with the business. Everybody in the business has a person who is a backup person as well. So, um, uh, you know, look, for those of you, I know I have a sort of a gregarious personality and so on, and have been the identifiable face of the business, but it is extremely important to me that uh, the business uh, survives and thrives without me, no matter when I leave for whatever reason. So that's actually incredibly important to me. So we put all of those plans in place. Um, I want simplicity to be something my grandkids invest in. Um, and that's not going to happen if it revolves around me, that's for sure. Oh, goodness, some of these are getting, yeah. Well, um, question from Alice from Facebook. What would you expect the highest home loan interest rate we could see in the next two to three years? Um, well, Alice, I would never have believed that we would see anything close to 5% if you'd asked me a year ago, um, and yet the banks are already charging that for long-term fix. Um, yeah, we don't know, I'm afraid. Um, everything just reflects what people see at the moment the reserve banks predicting that they're going to continue putting the ocr up for the next two years if that eventuates then interest rates could yet go higher but the reality is higher interest rates are already getting talked about so much it seems to me it's unlikely that they'll go as far as they would but that's a personal opinion our view is the best thing to do is just invest for the long term and hold um, I guess here's what I would say, Andrew. I've seen interest rates, mortgage rates as low as 1%, and I've seen mortgage rates as high as 26%. And, and those rates and every rate in between, owning a house was still a good idea. So they could go a lot higher. It doesn't mean that owning a house is a bad idea. Um. What are your thoughts on how volatile the market has been in the last few days? Um, your thoughts first? You got to go? Oh, no, look, you're the expert, Andrew. You, what do you think, mate? Um, okay, I was trying to read a question on the chat. Um, uh, I, I think that, uh, yeah, the, I mean, the market's been going through a bit of a, almost a, um, a an inward looking assessment of whether they underestimated the amount of inflation in the system, whether that central banks withdrawing all the money they pumped in is going to have a longer longer term impact and then you throw in the fact that um, you know russia and ukraine situation has has just unnerved things a wee bit again um it's it's the market's been going up for a very long period of time um and so we're we're having some jitters but in terms of the the short term volatility it is a a slightly less liquid time of the year than normal. Um, there are, yeah, we're, we're the one, one of the few countries along with Australia that's genuine on holiday at the moment, but um, uh, the rest of the world is a little bit less liquid than usual. So that may be one of the factors um, that, that's just meant it's been a wee bit more volatile. Um, but as I say, it had a bit of a, a real run up in the last quarter of last year. And all we've done really is reversed the last month of it. Um, let's see where we go from here. Financial markets hate uncertainty, right, Andrew? And yeah. they just hate it. And But I'm reminded of a famous investor who said, you know, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. So I wouldn't let these... If you have a good long-term strategy and you're a long-term investor, I wouldn't be overly spooked by these markets at all. This is just what happens. It's happened before and it will happen again. There is a question here on the chat, which I'm trying to... I'm muddling my way through. And I might ask... Um, uh, S. Pock, maybe send me an email because um, I'd like to look into this. It's just questioning why the performance of his two funds has been slightly different. My email address is just andrew.lance at simplicity.kiwi. So I could answer that directly. Um, it's probably going to be easier. Um, 
Uh, that's, thank you. What impact in percentage or dollar terms has becoming a default provider had on Simplicity's funds? Good question. Um, in terms of dollars, it's probably easier to, to answer. The total default fund size now is 380 million. So that was the amount of money that was transferred from the non-reappointed providers to each of the new providers, um, which represented about 37,000 members, Sam? Was that the... I think yeah, it, was about, it was about 37 and a half thousand members, yeah. Right. So that's yeah, a very significant um, amount of money. Um, it, it sort of took us from just over four to almost four and a half billion. Um, and so very, um, yeah, yeah, big boost to things and, and given us all uh, plenty to do in terms of extra members and uh, trying to explain markets to, to a bunch of new people. Um, question from Tillman, could you explain how the regular investment payments dominating conservative funds result translate into the value of the individual conservative share? I'm confused why the conservative dropped recently. Um, well, here's why it dropped. Andrew taught me this. It's great. Hmm. The conservative fund has a lot of bonds. These are bonds here. When the when the interest rates go, oh sorry, this is the, the market. The, the, when interest rates go up, the value goes down. When interest rates go down, the value of bonds goes up. So that's where the conservative fund went down. Interest rates go up, the value of the fixed interest bonds it has go down. The reason they go down is because they're paying a fixed rate. And let's say a bond was paying 2%. Well, if you could then go and get, say, 3% because interest rates are going up, the thing that you own, which only pays 2%, is worth less short term. But remember that you still get all your money back at the end and that 2% return. So you still make money. So that's why the conservative fund has gone down. That is perfectly normal. It doesn't spook us at all. It just means that you just wait until such time as either interest rates go up or you get paid your money back and then you reinvest that money at a higher rate. Right. Um, question from Matt. What is the timeline for simplicity living? When are you expecting to have people moving in? Yeah, we should be. So we started building our first uh, homes uh, a month ago. So they should be ready in about 14 months, 12 to 14 months. They'll be ready to take our first first tenants. It'll be exciting. And we're obviously continuing to acquire. And so we'll build a pipeline of homes. If we get to be big enough, folks, um, you know, that's in terms of money coming in so that we can fund this from investors. We're hoping to be building somewhere between 200 and 1,000 homes per year to rent out to our members. Um, is it, uh, question from Johan, it probably goes back to an earlier one and I'm trying to remember what it was. Is it better to rent? Can I, can I pause for a second? Yes. I've got to go and get a PowerPoint. My laptop's about to run out. So you, you handle this. I'll just be back in a sec, folks. There's still 120 of you on the call, one hour, 40 minutes later. Oh, no. Thank you very much. You've got tremendous staying power. Um, I'm trying to think what, Johan, what you mean, is it better to rent until we die? I, and that is basically not buy a property, presumably. From my point of view, as I said earlier, buying a property or not is not a, an investment decision. It's, it's a personal decision. However, if you're talking about property just as an investment, um, yeah, not sure. Uh, again, can't, can't advise you. Uh, it's just a different, it's a different asset to owning a managed fund. Um, a anonymous question about a small windfall of money looking to invest, mainly to use the money within the next two to three years to buy a house. Would you recommend investing in, in your fund, either the bond or conservative? We can't give you advice, I'm afraid. Um, the bond fund is, is simply that. It's relatively stable, has had um, gone down in value for the reasons we said already. But it's relatively stable. The conservative fund does have a few growth assets in it, so it's a little bit more uh, moves up and down a little bit more. But fundamentally, um, both are conservative. Um, but we can't give you um, personal advice, I'm afraid. Um, answer to Jeff because we get on, we do get asked this a bit. Are we considering having a growth fund that doesn't have bonds in it? Um, in other words, what they tend to call an aggressive fund. Absolutely, it's on our radar. It's something we're considering along the lines, as Sam said, of having something a little bit more more conservative uh, as well, having almost a sort of stable um, uh, characteristics. Similarly, the idea of 100% growth. Um, to date, 
we've decided to stick with the, the three larger funds, it's something that is absolutely on the radar, Jeff. Um, given how World Economic Forum says that someday you will owe nothing and you will be happy, what are your thoughts <laughs> on what we can do if the fiat currency system collapses? That's um, one for you. Yeah, look, if the fiat system currency collapses, I would go and buy a whole lot of vegetable seeds and learn how to grow vegetables. Because if the fiat currency system collapses, probably the modern economic system will collapse. Chances of that happening very low. Uh, certainly hasn't happened in recorded history. Uh, you know, there'll be some places where, you know, you've had revolution and so on. So that currency has ceased to exist, but another one very quickly uh, asserts itself and becomes the method of exchange. Maybe there's been some anarchic small communities, but the history of the modern world, certainly the um, in the last uh, 3,000 years has been fair currency. So, um, because of course governments want to control things and whether they're kings or democracies or oligopolies or whatever, they want to have a way by which you can exchange goods and services uh, other than doing physical barter. So a modern economy needs a fiat currency. Thanks, Anne. A um, couple of quick answers, which is easy. We've still got 100 people on the call, so um, we'll keep going. Thank um, you very much. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Do you need to be resident for the year to receive the government bonus? Um, you need to be a New Zealand resident, yes. Um, and each, whatever proportion of the year you are um, a, um, a resident, you get that proportion of the Five hundred and twenty dollars. Um, uh, yeah, so the, that's the answer that one. Sorry, I'm going to do something crazy here, Andrew. There's a hundred people have stayed on this call for one hour forty minutes. And they all deserve a free Simplicity T-shirt and hat. So <laughs> if you send an email to info at simplicity.kiwi and say Sam said I could have a free T-shirt and hat because I was on the call. Uh, I'm sorry, I know I'm going to get killed by this. Yeah, I was just going to say, the customers see them out there, they're reacting right appropriately. They're killing me, right? There's a hundred people there. They, 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 you, you're ambassadors. You deserve to carry our name and go out there and spread the word. Thank you. <laughs> oh, dear. I've just bought myself a lot of trouble there, but you deserve it if you've hung around. <laughs> um, okay, we'll crack on anyway. Can you retrospectively get money from the government for previous years in KiwiSave? I'm afraid you can't. No. Um, it's only for the current year. Um, RF from Vivian, are our investments eco-friendly, i.e. no fossil fuels, et cetera. Um, politically sensitive is a, is a difficult one, Vivian, because it's political and we don't, we, we are apolitical. Um, however, yes, we exclude fossil fuels, weapons, nuclear, we exclude gambling, alcohol. Um, we, we try to make them as, as yeah, eco-friendly as we possibly can within reason. So there are eight sectors we won't invest anything in, and there are four UN principles that we apply to our investments. Um, and of course, we run ourselves ethically. Of course, we're nonprofit. We're a social enterprise. We give 15% to charity. So we like to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. Um, uh, you know, this ethical thing is interesting. It's an ever movable debate. One person's ethics are not another person's, but we think we've hit a hit a uh, a level which is agreeable to the vast majority of our members. And it's the right thing to do. And by the way, you make higher returns over time too, investing that way because it's a better way to live too. Thanks, Dan. Um, question from Mervyn. Does simplicity intend in the near future to create a global equity fund comprising several hundred of the largest and best companies in the world to include in investment funds? Um, uh, there's an inference there that we would somehow know who the best companies are, which we don't. So therefore, we invest in a fund which invests in about the top 3,500 companies in the world. Um, and we believe that's a, a safer investment because it's diverse, diversified across the entire world. Anything you want to add, Sam? Uh, yeah, look, it's a perfectly fair. I know other people provide this. Um, uh, we could um, sort of on our long list of possibilities there. But I think, as Andrew said, an awful lot of, remember that, you know, if you think we've got three and a half thousand companies, they're not all, they don't all have the same amount of money. The bigger companies have more money, right? So Apple's the biggest company in the world. It's the largest investment uh, uh, we have. 
you know, so, and the bigger you are, the more we have. So in many ways, investing in our diversified funds, you really are very heavily weighted, particularly in the growth fund towards the top 500 companies in the world. Sure, yeah, yeah, good point. Um, question here from somebody anonymous. I don't understand how house prices in New Zealand are the most expensive in the world. Hawaii and California would like a word. Um, <laughs> What I'd, what I'd, I'd guide you to, um, if you go onto Bloomberg.com um, and just search the word Canada, there's a really interesting article on, um, on house prices. There's a, they're talking about a, a, uh, a bubble in Canada, but it shows, you'll see a chart in the middle of the article there, which shows um, New Zealand as being more expensive than Canada. And it's based on income to price and on rental to price across the world. Let me, let me give you just a little bit of feedback. The affordable homes we're building are going to last twice as long, we think, as, as um, the compliance codes. They're going to be extremely well built. They're also going to be built for between 25 and 30% less than the average house in New Zealand is being built. That is using all existing technologies. There's nothing new or fancy or different or radical there. That leads you to believe that house prices in New Zealand are too high and the cost of building a house is too high. So the the work that we've done over the years on this is we come to the conclusion that house prices aren't expensive in New Zealand for one reason. It's a whole lot of little reasons. Resource consent costs are high. Building material costs are high. Um, everything is done on small scale and bespoke, so it's more expensive. Um, financing costs are high. The banks rip you off because they make so much money. All these things all add up to it being very expensive. So there's no silver bullet. There's no one thing you can do which will dramatically bring down house prices in New Zealand or even cool house prices off, there's a whole lot of little things you need to do in order to do that. So it, it, it's a systemic problem that's been in New Zealand for decades and it's been growing. New Zealand house prices in New Zealand have been relatively expensive globally for a very long time. And that is for some very entrenched reasons. So, you know, the, the thing we know that we can help there with is supply. We can build a lot of homes for rent, which is affordable long-term and give people housing security. By the way, if you think about us as a social enterprise, what is the ultimate fence at the top of the cliff in terms of social problems? Is warm, dry, affordable, secure housing. It means your kids go to the same schools, people don't, kids don't have rheumatic fever, people are warm in winter. All of those sort of things lead to a dignity in life so if we can build those houses, provide that for a whole lot of New Zealanders and make fair returns for our members, in fact, good returns for our members, then that's a win-win-win. Who loses there in that are all of those people who charge all of those little margins that enrich them but impoverish the buyer or the renter of the property. So that's what we're doing in financial services generally. We're cutting out the banks. We're cutting out the middleman and we're just providing all benefits to scale back to our investors and we will do that in affordable housing too. There's a massive margin there. Some goes to the renter in terms of affordable rents. Some goes to our members in terms of better returns than we get than if we had the money in the bank. Uh, but there's a whole lot of people who won't benefit because we won't allow them to profit from our members and our renters. That's what we're here for. Thanks, Anne. Um, this one's probably more of you because this is the sort of things you keep an eye off, Sam. Um, question from Mark. Do you have a rough approximation of the percentage of money getting invested passively into the share market compared to active? Hmm. If passive grows to the majority of investment money, does this not have a negative impact on the true value of individual companies? Sure. I'm happy with the answer to the second piece. Do you know the answer to the first piece? Yeah, the first piece is almost all. And I'll tell you why. Officially, passive funds are about between 40 and 50% of official funds. We're passive fund. That's officially what we are. But I can tell you, having run, Andrew and I used to work for a big active manager, 80 to 90% of the money was invested passively. Actually, it was most active fund managers, what they call hug the index. So they stay close to the passive investment allocations and they actually make some fairly small bets to justify their fee. The, you know, which are on average three times ours because they don't want to take too much of a risk because they actually know in their heart of hearts they're probably unlikely to beat the market. So they'll do enough to give the illusion of being active, but most of it's passive. Now, that's my personal view, but I think you'll find that most active managers out there are pretty damn passive in their investments. They're just charging you an awful lot more. You've got to 
You want to see who owns all the boats in the marinas and all the fancy cars driving, not all of them, but a good chunk of them, finance industry professionals. Yeah. Um, the second half of the question there, um, Mark, is, is actually one that gets banded around a wee bit, and that's that passive uh, somehow inflates the value of, of individual companies versus others. But the reality is, and I know this from managing the New Zealand Share Fund, we're putting money in every single stock each time. So we're not, we're not inflating the value of any particular stock. If Fisher and Paykel or Fletcher's or whoever are the biggest percentage of the index, that's all we put in. And similarly, the, the, the stocks that we, we hold relatively small amounts of, they still get an allocation. So there's, there's an element, I suppose, of us not looking at the, the stocks that are so small, they're not in our index. But if we were doing that, we would be, apart from charging you much higher fees, we would be basically taking, in my opinion, far too great a risk with your funds. Um, we're far better off investing in the established businesses and, and just putting in the proportion that the index tells us we should. And if you've got want to expand on that, Sam. No, I think mean, it's, it's exactly right. And also, you know, you know what, these active managers are buying the same companies we are in approximately the same proportion. So they're also artificially inflating whatever vernacular they want listen we've I've heard you know i've heard we've heard all these arguments we we understand it most of it is <clears throat> justifying their fee justifying their existence but actually they're behaving remarkably similarly to the way we are just charging you way more for it um great thanks Sam. um question from doug and bill or probably not both um if you provide the proposed income product for retirees will you offer it widely to existing investors absolutely it will be in it will be available to anybody and anybody um question from michael which is sort of yeah close to home um it may sound trite given all the wonderful work we're proposing to do are you looking at recycling the massive waste that comes from the building industry um yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. Goes, goes yeah. down we're hugely focused on waste uh, and waste minimization. It's massive, the waste. Once, once again, that's because of small bespoke providers who just cannot get efficiencies of scale. So massively focused on that. Yep, it's a, it's wouldn't call it a crime because it's not, but it's an environmental crime how much waste comes from the building industry, that's for sure. Yeah, and so the, the entity that we've um, entered into a partnership with a are very focused on minimizing waste down to levels which are unheard of in that industry. Yeah, I think they have one sixth or one seventh of their waste of a typical, their typical competitor. Yeah. Good project, yeah. Uh, another question from Vivian, are rental properties only to be available to Simplicity members? Are home loans only for members or potentially any first home buyer? We're not. Yeah, well, that's our intention at this stage. That may change in the future, but right now we have plenty of demand from our members for the products that we can provide, and we want a very member-led organisation. So it costs nothing to be in any one of our products. You know, we don't charge a, a member fee anymore. So it's easy to join, and then once you join, you become part of the, you know, part of the family, I guess, and, and, and a, a member of Simplicity. And we want to create an ecosystem from the cradle to the grave that provides you with the financial services and products, and in this case, also the housing services and products that you need uh, at prices that you can afford and just makes life more affordable, more money, more choices, more dignity. It's a very, it's a very simple story, by the way. And by the way, it's not new. This is, this is what thrift societies and build societies, building societies have done for generations uh, all around the world. We're just doing it online uh and we're doing it because we want to and it's so it's not what simplicity is doing is is not new at all it's the idea is centuries old it's just people looking after people members looking after members um question on the along the same lines is there a waiting list for the rental apartments i mean essentially we haven't well, got that far yet but we haven't even got that far. i haven't even opened it up yet so as soon but we will let you know as soon as we do and yes of course we will we will seek a very fair and equitable way of making the, the apartments available to members here. A um, couple of questions from Bruce. Um, has the triple CFA had any meaningful impact on the cost of issuing simplicity mortgages and has there been an increased loan rejection rate because of triple CFA? Good question, Bruce. Um, yeah. it, it, it's, it has created a little bit of extra work. So I guess if time is money, um, then yes, it's cost more, but it hasn't actually cost us anything. And in terms of the rejection rate, our, our loan criteria are pretty conservative. Um, 
So therefore we haven't had to suddenly start rejecting loans that otherwise we would have accepted. Probably the increase in interest rates is, is more of a factor um, in that regard because people can borrow slightly less than they, than they could on the multiples that we use. Um, should really have our have Dan McGuire on here uh, to answer the question, but um, or Rachel. Um, well, I mean, I, if Dan was on the call, he'd tell you it's actually quite a bit of extra work. Um, mm. But there's also some subjectivity. One of the problems with the triple CFA is that as a director, I have a 200,000, I'm liable as a director of the company to $200,000 fine. And the company can be fined $600,000 for not acting reasonably. And the problem is, what does that mean? And the, so the lawyers are getting all scared about it. And because the lawyers like certainty, that, that phrase reasonable has a lot of uncertainty about it. So that needs to be clarified and then the system will settle down. The principle of triple CFA is, is correct. You shouldn't be lending to money you can't afford to people who can't afford to pay it off, which is why I personally think those sort of rules should be m made applicable to afterpay and all these other things that are trying to, you know, well, this is my personal opinion, who are trying to trick you into spending more money than, than you have. So, so you know, um, I think the principle of it is good. The application of it has been imperfect and we'll get it sorted out. Or oh, the government yeah. will get sort it out. It'll, it'll develop. Yeah. Um, and the next question from Bruce was, do you think the Reserve Bank will throw the economy into recession to combat inflation as they have done previously if high inflation rate exists? I mean, it's a good question. I, I yeah, the Reserve Bank has an expanded mandate now, right? It's not just about getting interest rates within a band and inflation within a band. It's also about basically ensuring the well-being of New Zealanders. So that's a really, really good question. And I think, I don't know is the answer, Andrew. I, I don't know what they will do now that they have to look after more things. They've also got an employment mandate mm -hmm. as well. Right? They do. New Zealand is employed. Well, if you throw it into recession, people lose the jobs. So I think it's a much more difficult job. I think Adrian Orr and the Reserve Bank have been given a lot of grief from old style economists who are saying, oh, you should have done it this way or not speak up so much or get involved. But look, they've just been asked to do a whole lot more by this government. And, um, you know, it, that's, it's a tough job. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a, it is a very interesting question. And, and I guess my view is they're not going to need to um, because we don't think inflation is, is going to get out of hand. But mm. if we're wrong, we could be wrong. Yeah, we could be wrong. Um, Gary, thank you for your note, because um, I realised when I was talking about, I think the question was, do you have to be resident um, uh, to, to be in KiwiSaver? I was thinking resident in the terms of the way that I am as, a, as, as I've got residency as opposed to actually being in New Zealand. You're absolutely right. You don't get the uh, government subsidy unless you're working for a sort of government or army type um, entity. You don't get the government um, contribution if you're not in New Zealand. Um, and so your, your answer is 100% right there, Barry. Sorry, I misinterpreted the question. Um, Bruce is back again in the sense, is ESG just a gimmick to sell more funds or are there meaningful weightings behind these scores? Um, we believe they're meaningful, um, Bruce. We, we believe that not investing in these industries is the right thing to do because it will give provide better returns to our investors over the long term. We believe, believe ultimately the fossil fuel industry will be a uh, will, will be left high and dry. Similarly, we believe it's right that we don't invest in a lot of these other uh, categories because we don't believe we should be investing in them. We don't believe we should be get, getting a return out of them. Um, so I don't know if you want to expand on that, Sam. I think you're right. I mean, for two reasons, Bruce. One is the ethics of it all. You know, um, <laughs> back in the old days, I'm sure you could have invested in slavery. That didn't make it a good thing, right? So there's the ethics of it, regardless of the returns. And then there's also the returns. The historic returns now are firmly in favour of ethical investing as making you more money. That's, I think, undoubted now. Every now and again, like, for example, in the last year, the fossil fuel companies have done really well relative to, but, but overall the trend is that consumers will stop using their products, lower demand, therefore people will not supply them capital to grow their businesses, so they'll get poorer, outdated equipment and they, you know, over time fade away or at least don't make as much money. So I think people's ethics will drive how they consume and the cons how they consume will drive how companies perform. So it's a pretty simple logic to me. Great. Um, 
question from Aaron. As a first-time buyer and with the triple CF rules in mind, would, could you describe the process of gaining a first-time mortgage with simplicity? To be honest, Aaron, it's much simpler just to go onto our website and have a look, um, simplicity.kiwi. Um, the, the, the rules are there in terms of what we, um, what we will lend, how much we'll lend, depending on your, your salary and how much of a deposit you've got for your house. It's probably a, a simpler process than me trying to explain. Yeah. Um, I'd probably get can... something wrong in Sam and Dan with yeah, you can follow up and ask questions of the mortgage team. They're utterly fantastic and they'll help you out. Um, question from Susan. My son lives in, overseas in Taiwan. He is a Kiwi, so can he invest in Simplicity funds from there? Um, Susan, yes, yes, he can. Um, the Simplicity investment funds are available to, to overseas investors, provided they can fulfill all the other criteria. One of the main ones is we, we insist that, they, that he has a New Zealand bank account um, because we don't, we don't want to go into the process of paying funds overseas um, and that also helps us from an AML CFT point of view as well but um, but fundamentally no problem um, and my goodness I think we may have got to the end here Sam from Vivian well, uh, would okay. residency include being a New Zealand taxpayer but living in Australia and working remotely um, that's it working remotely is an interesting one um, but basically Vivian, uh, and I think I did cover this off because I got it wrong the first time. Uh, if you, if we're talking about the government contribution, you have to be actually resident in New Zealand to receive that. Um, so no, if you're in Australia, uh, that, that wouldn't count. Um, I think we're done. Unless I've Thanks. missed some, uh, there may be some on the chat, but that last I looked, no, I think we're okay. Well, oh, thank um, you. Man. That's uh, two hours. It's, I think that's the longest one we've ever done, yeah? <laughs> Thank you very much for all the awesome questions. It's awesome. And uh, to the 76 participants who are left, thank you very much for, uh, yeah. for, for taking four hours. Your, your stamina. Sorry, was that? I say we appreciate your stamina. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. And as I say, I'm going to go and get myself um, lynched by the, the crew for promising you all a t-shirt. But you know what? They're all going to we all we all love would love the idea of you uh, running around. If you could just send us some information with your details, we'll ask you for your shirt size. But um, if you are a uh, a large, ask for a medium. If you're a medium, ask for a small. If you're an extra large, typically ask for a large. They're quite large size. The reason I love giving them out is um, they're actually made by um, a charity that we support, which out of Calcutta in India actually takes um, organic cotton and rescues uh, street prostitutes and their families from the streets and gives them a factory to work in, a school for the kids to go to, a home to live. And so we help support that business to just you know save people from the utter destitution of that life. And also they're incredibly long wearing, aren't they, Andrew? Oh yeah, they're great t-shirts. Amazingly high quality body. and they last a long time. So when we'd love, of course, we would love you to be walking around with a Simplicity t-shirt. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> so thank you very much, folks. Uh, and uh, we'll sign off from here. Great, thank you all. Cheers. Cheers Bye-bye now.